You've been lied to about the origins of St. Valentine's Day and its customs. If I ask you what you think of when you ponder this day, cards, flowers, chocolates, romance, and possibly the cynical commercialization of a supposed religious holiday by the companies who manufacture all the goodies I just mentioned are probably on the list. At the back of your mind, you could also be forgiven for thinking it's all based on the life and acts of a real guy. Saint Valentine, patron saint of love, or that it's an extension of a naughty little Roman festival called Lupercalia. Well, my friend, you'd be dead wrong. So set down the chocolates that are ruining your New Year's resolution to eat healthier, step away from the flowers before you start sneezing, and don't believe a word of the lovey-dovey junk about Valentine's life that the card marketers might be telling you. The real stories, plural, of St. Valentine are more horror than romance, with executions and dismembered bodies. So today on History Calling, I'm going to tell you those tales, as well as discussing how the 14th of February came to be associated with love, revealing where some of our Valentine's Day traditions come from, and sharing what a Tudor queen with a bad reputation gave to her own Valentines in the 1500s. When researching St. Valentine, the first problem you encounter is that history can't even agree on just one person to associate with his name and acts. Instead, there are numerous potential contenders for this particular honour, though only two who are ever seriously discussed, both of whom supposedly lived and died in the later 3rd century. Exact dates can't be agreed upon, but we're talking late 260s or early 270s for his death. The first was a Roman priest who was brought in front of the Emperor Claudius. When he refused to renounce his faith, Claudius had him imprisoned at the home of a nobleman called Asterius. While Valentine was there, Asterius asked him to heal the blindness of Asterius' adopted daughter, which he duly did. The entire household then converted to Christianity. Emperor Claudius wasn't impressed, though. He had Valentine executed and buried outside the Flaminian Gate of Rome. Asterius was sent away and also tried and executed. Like I said, this story is more horror than romance. The fate of the second potential Valentine was no better than the first. This guy was the Bishop of Terni, and he was definitely a real person, as he's mentioned in several records. This Valentine, who already had a reputation for healing, was summoned by a man named Cato to heal Cato's crippled son, Caramon. The Bishop initially said he would only do so if Cato and his household converted to Christianity, but Cato refused, and they reached a compromise whereby Valentine would restore the boy first, then the household would convert. This is what happened, but when the Roman Senate found out, they had Valentine arrested and beaten in an effort to make him renounce Christianity. He refused and was beheaded. His remains were buried outside Terni by some of his supporters, who were then also arrested and killed. Nowadays, there are churches all over Europe which claim to have bits of him, including Terni itself. There is also a skull in the Basilica of Santa Maria in Cosmodine with some equally dead-looking flowers on it, a forearm in Glasgow, Scotland, another set of remains in St Anton in Madrid, and relics including some of his blood in the Whitefriars Street Carmelite Church in Dublin. Poor Valentine has been broken up for parts, showing that whether you're a church, a confectioner, a card manufacturer, or a florist, this guy is good for business. As you can see, there are some striking similarities in these origin stories. In both cases, Valentine is associated with healing children, converting people to Christianity, and then being executed for his trouble, and because he wouldn't renounce his faith. He is in no way associated with love or lovers, though I did read popular but unsighted stories on the internet that he conducted secret marriages for people against the emperor's will, or that he fell in love with the blind girl and wrote her a love note signed Your Valentine. 
Without original sources to support them, though, these fanciful editions mean nothing. And when I read a blog entry by Dr. Natalie Goodison from the University of Durham about St. Valentine's Day, she specifically said that, quote, The statements of St. Valentine conducting secret marriages seem unsupported by medieval data. As for why Valentine's Day is celebrated on the 14th of February, that's because that's the date the original Valentines were supposedly brutally executed on. Romantic, isn't it? Before we get to some additional problems with these stories, if you're enjoying this content and getting value from it, please take a moment to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel with notifications switched on so that you never miss an upload. You can also find me on Patreon, where I share perks including early access to ad-free videos and mini-podcasts. This week, for instance, my time traveller and historical figure patrons will be getting a podcast explaining why a popular story about who wrote the first surviving Valentine message, which I've seen repeated by the likes of National Geographic, is actually wrong. I also have an Amazon storefront where I recommend lots of history-themed books and other items, and both are linked below for you, as is my Instagram. Aside from the fact that there are two separate origin stories for this saint, there are also issues with the sources for their lives. Both Valentines were meant to die in the later 3rd century, but the earliest records we have, which provide the stories I just told you, date to several hundred years later, in the 6th or 7th centuries. This is a problem, as is the fact that written records of saints' lives weren't really intended at this point to be rigorous, well-sourced biographies. Instead, they were hagiographies, which are works which are unduly reverent towards their subject, often to the point that they are mostly fantasy. If you see my video all about the real St. Patrick, which I'll link on screen and below for you, I discuss them a little more in relation to him. Then there's the Claudius problem. Emperor Claudius I was not alive at the correct time to match him up with Valentine's life, having reigned from 10 BC to 54 AD. Claudius II, aka Claudius Gothicus, was emperor at about the correct time, but there's no indication he undertook the kind of religious persecutions faced by the Valentines, and in fact, he wasn't even in Italy for most of his short reign, which only lasted from 268 to 270. We also have a list of martyrs supposedly killed within the Roman Empire, which was written up in 354, about 80 years after Valentine died, but he isn't on it. In fact, the information about Valentine is so scant and weak that although he is still recognised as a saint by the Catholic Church, he was erased from the general Roman calendar, which lists all the saints' days to be celebrated, in 1969. Ouch. Nevertheless, there is still evidence of a cult of St. Valentine before the 6th century, for Pope Julius I built a basilica in his name in the mid-4th century, it's just that the biography slash hagiographies I recounted to you a few minutes ago aren't recorded until much later, and the fact that Valentine doesn't pop up in the list of Roman martyrs has to make us wonder if, whatever his story was, it didn't end with him being killed by the Romans. So the issue at stake in this video isn't whether a St. Valentine was commemorated in ancient times, because evidently he was, but what he was associated with. The earliest extant records connect him with healing children, though I've also seen him called the patron saint of epileptics and even beekeepers. So why does his name signify love and romance to us? The earliest reference we have to Valentine being connected with any sort of romance comes from two poems written by English writer Geoffrey Chaucer, who lived between about the 1340s and the year 1400. The first is called Parliament of Foils, written in about 1381 to 82, and it presents St. Valentine's Day as a special day on which birds would find their mates. I'm not going to read out every mention Chaucer makes of Valentine, but one quote from that poem says, For this was on St. Valentine's Day, when every foil cometh there to choose his make, which I assume means mate. In the second poem, called The Complaint of Mars, Chaucer also discusses the association of St. Valentine's Day with mating birds, saying, St. Valentine, a foil thus heard I sing, Upon thy day her sun gan upspring. 
In a 1981 article about the history of Valentine's Day, written by Jack B. Oreck, which was my main secondary source for this video and which I've left details of below, Oreck argues that Chaucer was the original mythmaker when it came to associating St. Valentine with birds and love. He admits that we can't rule out some earlier custom linking this group, but saying we can't prove something didn't happen doesn't mean it did. So the reasons Chaucer chose to make this link are very murky. It's pushing it to associate spring, the time when birds mate, with mid-February. However, it just about works, especially as during Chaucer's time, a different calendar to the one we use today was in force, and as a result, springtime fell slightly earlier in the year, only just over a week, but every day counts for this argument. Oreck also posits that Chaucer may have linked Valentine with love because of an early French tale about a nobleman of that name who fell in love with and married a woman called Clarimond, only to be taken from her through a series of unfortunate events and forced to live in poverty until his death. Honestly, though, we don't know for sure why Chaucer did this. The idea of linking the saint's day with birds mating and human romance soon caught on. Charles, Duke of Orleans, who lived between 1394 and 1465, is known to have written poetry which connected Valentine's Day with human love, and in England, in February 1477, Elizabeth Bruce wrote to John Paston, who was in the process of arranging to marry her daughter, and remarked, And cousin, upon Friday is St. Valentine's Day, and every bride chooseth him a mate. Note how closely the final four words in this line resemble Chaucer's Parliament of Files. Her daughter Marjorie, the intended bride, also wrote to him at about the same time, calling John her right worshipful and well-beloved Valentine, and referring to herself as your Valentine. The associations between Valentine's Day and romance, and the use of the name as a synonym for sweetheart or some other endearment, were firmly established, and were set to continue. A couple of centuries after the time of the Bruise and Pastons, we come to the Shakespeare play A Midsummer Night's Dream, in which we find the character of Theseus saying to a couple of lovers, St. Valentine is past. Begin those woodbirds but to couple now? insinuating that this couple ought to have got together much sooner, around St. Valentine's Day. One of Shakespeare's contemporaries, English writer Michael Drayton, who was born in 1563 and died in 1631, wrote a poem about young lovers which also draws comparisons between Valentine's Day, the end of winter, and birds mating. It begins, Muse bid the morn awake, sad winter now declines, each bird doth choose a mate, this day's St. Valentine's. For that good bishop's sake, get up and let us see what beauty it shall be that fortune us assigns. Chaucer's reach had indeed been extensive. If we move away from his long-term influence, though, other theories as to how Valentine and romance came to be associated with one another have also been floated over the centuries. In the mid-18th and early 19th centuries, two writers named Albin Butler and Francis Deuce combined some of the stories I've already shared with you about two men called Valentine with pseudo-information presented as fact about the origins of the day's romantic customs. In these stories, such practices are an offshoot of the Roman fertility festival of Lupercalia, which was celebrated on the 15th of February and was erroneously presented as being centred around lovers, with girls' names drawn from a box by men in a kind of love lottery. This did happen in medieval and early modern England, I'll be giving you some Tudor and Stuart examples later on, but Lupercalia did not include any such customs, and instead you were more likely to find animals being sacrificed and people running around naked while they were whipped. Trust me, it doesn't resemble anything we'd now associate with Valentine's Day. Jack Oreck dismantles these theories very efficiently, saying, The idea that Valentine's Day customs perpetuated those of the Roman Lupercalia has been accepted uncritically and repeated in various forms up to the present. Most of those who offer this now traditional explanation cite no sources or refer only to Butler or Deuce. This is a common problem in history. 
One person makes a mistake and then others blindly follow it without checking the evidence. For another example, see my video on whether Anne Boleyn was pregnant at the time of her execution. Spoiler alert, she wasn't, and that whole myth was created by one self-proclaimed historian's extremely poor attempt at analysing the sources. In more modern times, St Valentine's Day has also been wrongly associated with the Feast of the Purification, which, it is incorrectly claimed, was used by Pope Galasius I to replace the Lupercalia in the late 5th century. There is no contemporary evidence to support that theory, so please pay it no heed. Another story has it that the association stems from the fact that Valentine's supposed burial place happened to be close to where the Romans celebrated the festival of Anna Perenna, which did involve men and women engaging in some romantic behaviour. There is very little evidence to support this association though, and Auric is scathing of it. So the connections between St Valentine and romance began, as far as we can tell, with Geoffrey Chaucer, and soon took hold and grew, over the course of decades, then centuries, into the customs we have today. In 1721, Nathan Bailey gave the following definition of Valentine's in his Universal Etymological English Dictionary, though I'm quoting the third edition from 1726. Valentine's, in England. About this time of year, the birds choose their mates, and probably thence came the custom of young men and maidens choosing Valentine's, or special loving friends, on that day. Let's look a little more at this custom of choosing a valentine and at the practices of gift giving and exchanging cards. Tracing the exact origin of these customs worldwide is beyond the scope of this video, but I do have some examples to share with you which show that they are several centuries old at the very least. A blog post from the British Library indicates that Valentine's Day lotteries were happening in the English court by the mid-1400s. Again, my upper-level patrons will get a little bit more information about this. And I have a couple of very specific examples for you from the reign of Henry VIII, which refer to his eldest daughter, Princess Mary, later Mary I. Now, Mary doesn't have the best reputation. In fact, I would say she's my least favourite of the Tudor monarchs, despite the fact that I do have a lot of sympathy for what her father put her through during her teens and twenties. But she wasn't without a sense of fun, nor, despite her strong Catholic faith, was she above allowing saints' days to be used to indulge that fun, as her Valentine's history shows. An entry in her 1538 accounts tells us that one George Mountjoy received 40 shillings having, quote, drawn my lady's grace to be his valentine. Five years later, in 1543, Sir Anthony Brown did even better. After he drew Mary, he got, quote, a brooch of gold enamelled black with an agate of the story of Abraham with four small rocked rubies. So your valentine didn't have to be your significant other. It was all just a bit of fun, really. And it was also commonplace by the 1530s to give them gifts. This remained the status quo in the following century. On the 16th of February, 1667, English diarist Samuel Pepys wrote that he and his wife went to a Mrs. Pierce's house. Quote, and there I find Mrs. Pierce's little girl is my valentine, she having drawn me, which I was not sorry for, it easing me of something more than I must have given to others, end quote. The drawing of names, then, was something done amongst groups of friends, even when one wasn't present, as the drawing presumably happened on the 14th in Pepys's absence, and it was innocent enough that children could take part in it too. This was lucky in his view, as he could get away with buying a cheaper gift for a young girl than for a grown woman. What might a gift be at this time, though, for one of Pepys's rank? Well, here too he is most helpful, for if we backtrack slightly to 1661, we get a diary entry from him in which he says that he and his wife went to Sir William Batten's, quote, and there sat a while, he having yesterday sent my wife half a dozen pairs of gloves and a pair of silk stockings and garters for her Valentine's gift. Interestingly, in Pepys's circle, the gift-giving was limited to men buying women. Yet back in the Tudor era, Princess Mary had had to fork out cold hard cash and expensive jewels to her Valentine's. 
A lottery wasn't the only way of getting a valentine. Another tradition was that it was simply the first unmarried person of the opposite sex that you saw on the morning of the 14th of February. It's back to Shakespeare for an early example of this. In Hamlet, the character of Ophelia opines, Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, all in the morrow betime, and I made at your window to be your valentine. Pepys recounts this same practice in 1664, saying, This morning comes betimes Dickie Penn to be my wife's valentine, and come to our bedside. By the same token, I had him brought to my side, thinking to have made him kiss me, but he perceived me and would not, so went to his valentine. Four years later, he was called from his bed in the morning by the arrival of Mary Mercer, quote, who came to be my valentine. And so I rose, and my wife, and were merry a little, I staying to talk, and did give her a guinea in gold for her valentine's gift. There comes also my cousin Roger Pepys betimes, and comes to my wife for her to be his valentine. Pepys also noted something else I thought worth mentioning, for in 1667 he wrote that, Here I do first observe the fashion of drawing of mottoes as well as names, so that Pierce, who drew my wife, did draw also a motto, and this girl drew another for me. What mine was, I have forgot, but my wife's was most virtuous and most fair, which, as it may be used, or an anagram made upon each name, might be very pretty. I wonder if this, along with the more polished poetry of Chaucer and others, was the genesis of the little poems we get in cards today. Speaking of cards, I found an article, linked in the description box, discussing the seal in 2019 of what was thought to be the world's oldest surviving English-language Valentine's Day card. It dates from around 1790 and is handwritten. The oldest printed Valentine's Day card I located dates from shortly afterwards, in 1797, and was produced in London, though in this case, it looks as though the recipient, who was a man called Mr. Brown, was receiving some unwanted attentions, for the message inside the card read, Mr. Brown, as I have repeatedly requested you to come, I think you must have some reason for not complying with my request, but as I have something particular to say to you, I could wish you make it all agreeable to come on Sunday next without fail, and in doing you will oblige your well-wisher, Catherine Moss Day. Oh dear, Catherine, I hope at some point you took the hint and backed off. Finally, I thought you might enjoy this cute little comic strip from 1891, which depicts some Valentine's Day practices, including the boys trying to win the girls' hearts, and, in the middle and right images on the top line, picking flowers in the fields for their sweethearts to put in their hair, and buying them trinkets such as a necklace. Regarding the flowers, I wondered, and this is just idle supposition on my part, if flowers became popular because they could be acquired cheaply from one's garden or even a nearby hedgerow. I'm no gardener myself, mind you, so I'm not sure what you could get in mid-February, and no doubt it depends whereabouts you live. I hope you found that trip through the history of St. Valentine and the customs which have become attached to St. Valentine's Day interesting. Let me know in the comments below what your favourite or least favourite practice associated with the day is, and if you'd like some more saintly history, try one of these options next. Until next time all, keep learning.